everybody. It seems like it's been a while, been a few weeks, but uh, I tell you, it's good to see everybody. Good crowd here this morning, and I'm excited. I've enjoyed the worship, man. I always appreciate the band and leading us in worship and music. But I uh, uh, wanted to let you know uh, also, if, in case you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, a uh, missionary uh, from Peru, Mike Kendi, was here speaking, and you know, I thought he did a great job and had a full altar and a lot of people, you know, making decisions and things like that. And he just wanted to let us know that, man, he said, thank you for letting us come to your church. And he said, y'all have got an awesome church. We thank you for your support, and uh, we just want to let you know that, man, we're, we're, we're excited to be a part of what's going on at Cross Point. So, all right, today I want to talk about uh, something that's going to affect all of us. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that I think that we all deal with, and as long as we're alive, we're going to deal with this. It's something that all of us face, but I think there's too many of us that are defeated in it, and there's too many of us that are not getting victory, and we need to figure out what, maybe what we're doing. I pray today as we look into Scripture that we're going to see how that you can overcome something that maybe you've been battling for years and years and years. I want to talk about temptation today. I want to talk about temptation because it's something that, for some of us in this room right here, you've been battling the same thing for a long time. And let me tell you what will happen when you do that. You'll feel like a failure as a Christian. You'll feel like, what am I doing wrong? You'll feel like, you know, why am I, 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 I you know, God doesn't love me because I keep falling for this same temptation, this same thing. But let me just tell you something. As long as you and I are alive on this side of eternity, temptation is going to face us. It's going to happen. It's part of life. But we've got to declare warfare against it. And we've got to know how to use God's Word and how to understand how God wants us to walk with the Spirit. And we're going to talk about that today. And some of you are going to be freed from some bondage, something that you just keep falling into. And a lot of times you don't talk a lot about it. Because you keep messing up, and you keep messing up, and you keep doing the same thing. You may think it's small, you may think it's big, but it keeps happening, and you think, I'm a failure. You know, God doesn't love me, and I'm telling you, it's the very opposite. God loves you no matter what. His love is unconditional for you, and you have to understand that. Maybe you said, well, I just can't stop. I just can't overcome it. I've prayed, and nothing happens. I've tried everything, and I can't quit doing such and such. And I'm going to ask you in a little bit, you're going to name that, whatever that is. Because the Holy Spirit's going to let you know real quick, because you already know. But I want you to identify it, because you say, I can't overcome it. Sometimes we do feel guilty, uh, because we keep messing up. But I'm telling you, I want you to get victory of this. Some of you are going to be freed from some bondage, and you're going to get victory over this today. But the good news is, is we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. The good news is, we don't have to fight alone. You and I don't have to fight this temptation alone. And you don't have to feel bad about, about the way that you're tempted and the way that you've messed up. you just got to figure out how to overcome it. There's times and seasons in my life where I, I fell in that temptation longer than others. And there's some things that, you know, that, that I still have a hard time with sometimes when the temptations come. But I wanna, I'll, we're going to look at a, 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 something that somebody had written about five steps of how temptation happens. And you can write those down here in a few moments. And then after that, we're going to look at two things we need to do to overcome it. Because I think a lot of us have a wrong perspective on how to overcome our temptations and the way that Satan is attacking us. So let's look at what Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 13. Paul says this. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted... He will also provide, look at this, a way out so that you can endure it. So that you can endure it. It's going to happen. Now, I think that here Paul is talking to the Corinthians here, uh, the people in Corinth, and I think that they're struggling with temptation. And some of you have walked in here today, didn't know he's talking about this. The Holy Spirit designed you to be here. He's going to speak directly to you and about how to get victory over this. And I pray that you all respond. I challenge the first group, 
uh, and they a huge, good response, hands going up, of people that said, you know what, that's me. And so as the Holy Spirit speaks, I pray that you just realize that the Holy Spirit loves you. Let, let me get this straight. If you're a child of God, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And I want, to, I want to show you where the Bible says that when we walk in the Spirit, how you can get victory over this. Temptation. So we're going to talk about that. It's something that, that we all battle with. Five steps here. I'm going to give you the five steps, and then I'm going to give you a kind of a little personal silly illustration, but then we're going to relate it because it's going to get more serious in your situation because it's not going to be as, as silly. But here's the five steps as the process of temptation, as one man wrote. He wrote this. He said, it starts off with a thought. Whenever you, you, you start dealing with temptation, the temptation comes, it starts with a thought in your and my head. And then it goes into imagination. And, and then, then, then from the imagination, it goes into justification. And then from justification, it goes into choice. And then from choice, it goes into sin. Okay? Now, I don't know about y'all, but I'm trying to eat healthier. I'm really trying to do good. But I, you know my weakness are sweets, right? How many chocolate's your weakness? That's mine, yeah. And, and my favorite dessert is, yeah, is, is, is cheesecake. My favorite cheesecake is turtle cheesecake. Now, I said this about three or four years ago in a message, and somebody brought me a turtle cheesecake. So if the Lord leads you in that way, that'll be... No, don't do that. Don't tempt me like that, all right? Anyway. But anyway, let's just, for the, for the purpose of an example and an illustration to, to, to understand this process... Okay, I'm trying to do better, and I know I don't need to have turtle cheesecake, right? I don't need to have sweets. I'm trying to do good. I'm trying to eat healthier and take care of my temple better and, and live longer so I can do ministry longer. and just trying to do good, you know. But let's just, for the sake of example, because my wife would never do this, but let's just say she brings a turtle cheesecake in the house, all right? And she knows I'm not supposed to eat turtle cheesecake. And so let's say she puts it in the refrigerator, okay? So now the turtle cheesecake is in the refrigerator, and I know it's in the refrigerator, all right? So it's a Sunday afternoon, and I'm at home, and I'm watching maybe a football game or a basketball game, and I'm just sitting there just chilling, minding my own business. And all of a sudden, Satan puts that thought in my mind. That cheesecake is in the refrigerator. Are you with me? I believe Satan, in our temptations, the first thing is a thought, and I believe Satan puts that thought in our mind that, hey, you know, this is your weakness, and if I can get you to fall for this process, then you're going to go down. So I'm sitting there minding my own business, here comes that thought. The cheesecake is in the refrigerator. All right, what happens next? I start thinking about it, and I'm thinking, hmm, cheesecake sounds good. <laughs> then the second thing happens, imagination. Imagination, my mind starts thinking about that cheesecake. It starts going around and around, and I'm thinking about the caramel and the chocolate and the pecans going in my mouth. See, the imagination starts to, starts to turn, doesn't it? And then it goes into justification, which is the third one on your, on your line, justification. Now I'm sitting there going, I've been doing good for so long, one little piece of cheesecake is not going to matter. So I'm sitting there going, and then the next thing is, is I make a choice. And that choice is, is I get up and I go to the refrigerator and get me a slice of cheesecake. And then the next thing you know, a few moments later, I'm sitting there in my recliner going, what in the world happened after three slices of cheesecake? <laughs> now that's silly, right? It's kind of funny. But that's the way temptation works, and I wanted to kind of illustrate this process of it starts with a thought. And your temptations and my temptations, we have to realize that this Satan's going to put that thought there, and he's going to try to get us to lure through this process until, like so many of us, we're sitting there going, why do I keep doing this? How does this keep happening to me? It starts with a thought. Then you start letting it run through your mind imagination. Then all of a sudden we start justifying and the next thing you know, you know, you and I make a choice, a bad choice, and we keep falling for the same thing over and over and over. And, you know, and, and maybe you're like that. And what I hate about it for us is if you're like that, there's something going on in your life, you, you might feel like a failure. You might feel like the, you're even questioning your salvation. How could I even keep doing this if this keeps going on in my life? But I think a lot of times we're looking at it at the wrong way. But maybe your, your thing was, is I'll give you a few more illustrations just to kind of hit a few more people. But this will get a little more serious because maybe it's like you're supposed to buy, you, you, buy an outfit for you is a sin. Now, of course, buying an outfit is not a sin. But you've got 20 outfits in your closet still with the price tag zone. You ain't even worn the first time. You're in debt, and you've already kind of made a promise, all right, I'm going to stop doing this. So this is your process right here. The thought is, 
well, I feel alone, I'm kind of lonely, and I'm kind of down. And so, so you say, all right, that's your thought. You know, if I could buy something, it'd make me feel a little better. And then the imagination starts kicking in, and you start picturing a new outfit that you would buy, and all of a sudden you put it on Instagram, and all of a sudden you get a bunch of likes, and all of a sudden your imagination says, now you'll feel better. And then the justification comes in. Well, I haven't bought one in a few days. That makes it all right. And then the choice comes in. You say, I'll just look online just to see if there's any sales. And so you make the choice to go online, and there's a 25% discount. And all of a sudden now you've purchased it, and you say, God, thank you for looking out for me. And then you find yourself there again with your 21st outfit. And it keeps happening and happening and happening. Maybe if you say, I'm bored, I'll just look and see what's on my phone. That's your thought. Then your imagination. I remember seeing something last week that was really, really got me excited. And then we use justification. Well, nobody's really going to know about it. And so everybody else is doing it anyway. So my wife really hasn't been taking care of my needs, so blah, 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 blah. blah. Then the next thing you know, you make a choice. And you click, and you click, and you click, and you start looking, maybe even send some, sin, some sins. And the next thing you know, you go, how do I keep doing this? You see, I don't know what your situation is. There's so many situations like that I could go through that just keeps happening, keeps happening, and the process keeps, and I want us to understand this is what's taking place, and it all starts with a thought. And then we've got, we've got to make some changes. If this keep happens to you, keeps happening to you, you've got to make a change. And with God's word, says, he, he says in 1 Corinthians, we don't have to do this alone. We don't have to do this alone. He will find us a way out. But the key to it, and I'm going to explain more of this later, you've got to walk in the Spirit. The temptations for you and I were no match for Satan, and we're going to keep tripping up until we figure out a new way. And a lot of times what we do is we think it's our thought process. You know, we, we think it's the way we think. If I can just stop thinking about it, then that will take care of it. Well, that's true. That does, the Scripture says that's one of the things. Sometimes you have to flee from situations and get away from those thoughts or if you're in that environment so you won't think about it. And sometimes that is a situation. But I want to give you another way. God is faithful. He's going to help you get out. And you can get victory over this. And this is going to be life-changing for some of you today. Some of you are finally going to get victory and figure out how to do this. And you say, I'm not going to stay in temptation anymore and in bondage in this cycle of just keep doing and doing and keep ending up at that same point of saying, why do I keep doing this? Some of you are always tempted to complain. Well, that's just the way God made me. No, there's a way out for you. There's a way out for you. Some of you say, well, I always compare. I'm I'm a jealous person. I'm envious. I'm always looking what other people have, and I'm insecure. No, God says there's a way out. Some of you overspend. Some of you worry too much. Some of you have addictions, social media, gambling, gaming, maybe something you drink, something you smoke, something that's inappropriate you look on the Internet, whatever it may be. God says that whatever it is, you can overcome it because I will give you a way out. Now, I'm not making light of anybody's situation because sometimes I'll I'll get people and they'll say this and that and you just don't understand me and what all I've been through. And I'm not making light of your situation. But I'm also not going to make light of God's word. If God says there's a way out and he's going to provide it, if we do it the right way, he's going to provide a way out. And I'm also not saying that your temptation is going to totally go away. But I do believe that, and we'll see this in a little bit more, you, you, you walk in the spirit, the less the temptations will be. And we'll see this here in just a few moments. But the challenge is I think we we need to stop thinking about, if I can just stop thinking about the temptation, you know, but I don't know about you, but when I try to stop thinking about stuff like that, I start thinking about it. Is that the way? Anybody follow me? It's like, I'm not going to think about it anymore. Gosh, I'm thinking about it again. So what we need to do is maybe start thinking about what we should be thinking about, what we should be thinking about. And I want you to put your thinking hats on right now. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5 and verses 16 and 17, because this is going to be a key verse right here. Paul, now he's talking to the the people in Galatia, the Galatians. And look what he's going to tell them. Paul said, so I say, because these people must be battling with temptation too, so I say to walk by the Spirit. What does that mean? It means to stay close to God, walk by the Spirit. And what does he say? You will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Now, what what is the desires of the flesh? The desires of the flesh are kind of our sinful nature. It's a picture of our sin. Now, you and I have this flesh, and because of this flesh, we want to please what makes us feel good. And that's what tempts us. That's what causes us. So whenever you see in the Scripture the flesh or you see a sinful nature, that's what he's talking about. But Paul says, look, if you'll just walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And for the follower, you realize real quick, as a follower of Christ, hey, we're in a spiritual warfare. We're in a spiritual warfare. It's going on, and it's real. What we want to do, 
and what Satan's trying to lead us to do and what the Spirit of God wants us to do is two different things, and we've got to figure out what, what, what should we do here? What can we do? Look at verse 17. Paul goes on to say, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. If you walk with God's Spirit, if you walk by the Spirit, you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh, is what Paul is saying. So if you want to help with this temptation coming to you, if you want to help to get victory of this and win over it, whatever it may be, you've got to start walking in the Spirit. Uh, Paul, you know, he often said in Romans 7, he's the one talking here, and if anybody knows it, it's Paul. Paul says, look, I've lived life long enough. He says, I've been through some situations. I've been on the opposite side of Christianity, and now I'm on the right side of, of, of the way Christianity is supposed to be, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. He says, but still... What I want to do, and Romans said, what I want to do, I end up not doing. And what I don't want to do, I end up doing. And it's like this cycle that I have. And so he's teaching them this, and he's teaching us today. Many of you can relate to this. We can relate to it. Keep going in the cycle. You keep doing it. You keep, you keep struggling with it. And you keep going through it, and you're saying, what must I do? So you say, I want to read my Bible, and you do good for three days, and all of a sudden, you stop doing it. Maybe you say, I want to go jogging and start getting, getting healthy. And so you get up in the morning and you get ready to go and you find out it's 10% chance of rain. You say, well, I shouldn't do that because I don't want to mess up my new shoes that I just bought. We find every excuse that we know we don't want and we wonder why we keep getting in this cycle. But let me give you two, a couple of key thoughts right here. This is huge. And it's true principles. And you can fill the blanks out in your, in your worship guide. What you feed grows. What you feed is going to grow. And what you starve is going to die. What you feed is going to grow, and what you starve is going to die. It's a true principle. If you keep feeding yourself and keep feeding yourself, keep feeding yourself, what's going to happen? You're going to grow, right? You're going to get bigger. If you start starving yourself, what's going to happen? If you don't eat, you're going to die, right? It's going to kill you. Some of you like to grow plants. You bring a plant home, all right? You, you put it in your house. You start feeding it, what's going to happen? Taking care, it's going to grow. But if you just ignore it and don't, it's going to die. See, it's a principle. It's the same thing. If you feed your, your, your uh, fleshly nature, if you feed that, then it's going to grow and your sinful desires are going to grow. And some of you are still feeding your fleshly desires and things that you shouldn't be doing, and you're wondering why you still got this cycle going on. But if you starve that fleshly nature, it'll start to die. If you feed the Spirit, your spirit will go stronger. That's right. And your intimacy, God, will increase. So instead of just thinking, no, no, I shouldn't do this, how do we starve out the flesh and walk in the Spirit? The question is, is how do we overcome those wrong desires of the flesh? Let me give you two things. We'll kind of talk about this the rest of the time. Two things. How do we starve out that fleshly nature? How do we starve it out? Because you're battling with it, and I've battled with it over the years. How do we starve it out? How do we do this? Two thoughts. How can we get the Holy Spirit to help us? The first thing is this. We need to learn to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. And let me just stop there because a lot of people, when I start talking about the Holy Spirit, you, you get kind of confused and, and you kind of, you know, I'm not sure about that. You, you know, the Trinity and all, I understand the Trinity and, you know, there's God the Father and there's God the Son and there's God the Holy Spirit. And I understand all, I mean, the God and, and the Son, but I'm not sure about the Holy Spirit. I'm kind of you know, it's kind of confusing to me. And there's a lot of people that I come in contact with, that's kind of the way it is. And maybe you even push back from the Holy Spirit when I talk about walking in the Spirit. Let me just tell you something. When you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit's the greatest gift you can have. And it's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to be confused about. And what Paul is trying to teach the people in Corinth, and he's trying to teach the people in Galatia, he's trying to tell them, look, you walk in the Spirit, and you can overcome this. And Paul is one, he says, I know because it's working for me now. I understand this. Walk in the Spirit. So it's, you shouldn't be afraid of walking in the Spirit. When, and I'm going to show you some things that's going to help you. And I pray, because I told the first group, and I'm not being negative, there's going to be some of you that may, you may walk out of here and say, I ain't doing that. Well, you'll have, to, you'll have to battle that battle with the Lord. But I'm telling you, if you will do it, if you'll do these two challenges I got and get serious about it and, and try to really work through this, I'm telling you, you will get closer intimacy with God and your walk with Him can be incredible. But anyway, the, one of the greatest gifts you can get is the, is the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do for us? To try to help you to understand a little bit in case you don't know. The Holy Spirit, what does He do for us? He convicts us of our sin. He convicts us of our sin. 
That's right. Because when you, you and I, when we go and we start doing something, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit goes, uh, no, you don't need to be doing that. You need to be doing this over here. Or you start walking in one direction, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 stop, stop, go over here. In other words, he's going to convict us of our sin. Or if we don't do this and do this, and you know all these things that we're doing that we're not supposed to do, the Holy Spirit is there to convict us of our sin. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit, Jesus even told the men when he was, right before he was to leave, because they was like, don't, you know, we don't understand, you know. He said, look, when I leave, i got to leave so that one can come that's going to be even better. And he was referring to the Comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God was going to dwell within them. And then we'd get the chance to either choose to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit or not. But the Holy Spirit is going to help you through any struggle that you're going through, any temptations, any battles that you've got, Paul says in the scripture here, inspired by God, that, hey, no matter what you're going through, I won't put too much that you can bear. Let me just say this, because some people have preached that, hey, God will put more than you can bear, so you'll have to trust him. That's not what I'm saying. The scripture here, when you see it, is twofold. It says God won't put more on you than you can bear when you walk in the Spirit. He's going to provide a way out for you. And the problem is, is there's too many people not walking in the Spirit. You see, they're trying to solve it themselves. They're trying to figure out themselves. They're trying to overcome them problem, their problems themselves. And they're not walking in the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to prompt you in ways, because His ways are higher than our ways, and it's gonna, He's going to prompt you in ways that you wouldn't normally do. And the problem that too many Christians are doing is you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. That's why you're struggling. That's why you're not overcoming. That's why that cycle keeps continuing, and you, you keep continuing and continue. Next thing you know, you know you're out of church for a while. Then, you, then, then, then the next thing you know, you're just you're not happy with yourself. And that's not what God wants. But the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin. The second thing that He does is He can uh, comforts us. That's right, He comforts us. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life when I, I was going through a really hard time, and I just was praying and down on my knees and just. I was hurting, and I was just really begging God, and I was talking and, and, and praying, and, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just comforts me in a way. It's the peace that's beyond our understanding. It's a way that he can comfort that no one else can. What else does the Holy Spirit do? He, that he counsels us. He guides us in the way that we should go. This is the way that you should go, the Holy Spirit will say. So when we're battling temptation, you don't have to do it on your own because he dwells within you. We can come, overcome the, the, the desires of the flesh. You can overcome that. Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 12 and 13, look what he says. Paul says this. He says, you have no obligation. I love this. You are not obligated whatsoever to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. And then in verse 13, he says this. For if you live by its, dic by its dictates, you will die. You will die. Now, it's a little dramatic, Paul. Come on now. Just because I fall into temptation don't mean I'm going to die, all right? But no, look what he's saying here. Look what he's saying here. He's saying that you're going to destroy your life. You're going to mess up your life. Your, mice, your life is going to be a mess if you live by your temptations and the sinful nature in your life. If you didn't say, if, sin can be fun for a little while. How many of you agree, agree with that? Sin's fun for a season. All right. Not many of you agree with that. How many of you agree sin's fun for a season? All right, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're not doing it right, all right? Because sin's fun for a season. That's just being honest. Sin's fun for a season. But it always ends in destruction. It always ends in a mess. And usually in the beginning, we all say, well, it's not really that bad, or you compare it to somebody else's temptation and where it's going to, the sin it's going to lead to, and you're kind of justifying, you know, it's not that bad. Somebody said this, sin thrills, and then it kills. Sin thrills, and then it kills. Another saying is sin fascinates, and then it assassinates. But the whole thing is, when you start dabbling in sin, it's going to bring destruction. And we've got to understand that. It can be fun for a little while. Just kind of an illustration. Let's say a, a young married man starts to smoke dope. And uh, he says, I'm just going to you know, smoke weed a little bit, and and it's no big deal, you know. And next thing you know, it's happening several times a week. And, uh, you know, still no big deal. And next thing you know, it's happening more and more. And next thing you know, it's every day. Now, next thing you know, he can't go without it. And he's got to have it all day long just to make it through the day. Then the next thing you know, this young man has lost his wife, lost his home. He's lost everything he's got. You know, he's destroyed everything he's ever had, all because sin took him farther than he really wanted to go. And that's a saying that I've, I've always said for years. Sin will take you farther than you, because you'll wake up and you go, how in the world did I end up here? You know, why do I keep doing this? And then how did I end up way over here? Sin, sin thrills and then it kills. It kills marriages. 
It kills homes. It kills your intimacy with God. It kills your testimony. It kills your finances, your credibility. All these things, it will, it will just destroy in your life. Then look what Paul says. Let's look at this whole verse again. You have no obligation. Listen to this. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. And then look at this. But if you live through the power of the Spirit, you put death, you put to death, what do you mean? You're going to starve it out here. If you live through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. There it is. Paul's a man that understood this. He's inspired by, by God to write this scripture down for us to hear today. Hey, you can either walk by the Spirit or you can just fall into the lust of your, sin, your sinful nature. And he's saying, look, if you'll, put that, if you'll walk in the power of the Spirit, you can put to death that sinful nature and you will live. There are those that hear, you here today, you need to tap into that. You need to tap into the power of God. You need, to, you need to realize that the Holy Spirit dwells within you and you can't handle certain things and you're powerless against certain things. Now, who is the power greater than ourselves? Look at this. In AA, they have a, a saying here, this really cool kind of prayer that they pray in Alcoholics Anonymous. Look at this. And then I've rewrote one to kind of apply for today. But they say this. They say, we admit we are powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore our sanity. I like that. Now, who is the power greater for ourselves as far as the, the fall of Christ? We believe it's the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe it's the power of the Holy Spirit that can overcome the, those things. There are a few of you here, if you'll just listen to this, you can have a breakthrough in your life. But I've rewritten this version of the prayer. This is what I've said today. And I want us, it's in your outline, I want some of you to fill this blank out. I want you to fill it out. I admit that I am powerless over blank. I'm powerless over blank. I believe that the power of the Spirit of God will heal me and make me whole. That's our prayer. But what would you put in that blank? What is that thing that you are powerless over and you know it? What is it? Then you've got to say, I believe that the power of the Spirit of God will heal me and make me whole. Is it powerless over food? Is it powerless over materialism? You can't stop buying, buying, buying. Is it powerless over worry? You say, I'm obsessed with worry, and I just worry about my family. I worry about my finances. I worry about all these different things, and I'm just powerless over it. Put it in that blank right there. Write it in. I'm powerless. Maybe it's a sexual addiction. You have to call it what it is. I'm, if you're powerless over it, hey, he can help you to overcome it. Maybe it's dope, pot, alcohol, meth, dip, pain, medication, whatever it may be, and you're powerless over. Write it in that blank. I'm powerless over what? This can be a defining moment for some of you. I want you to write it in the, in the blank there. Write it in. I don't want to be here too long, but some of you, this is, a, this is a moment of truth. This is a moment of truth. It's time to break that cycle. It's time to break that. It's time to, to stop being defeated. You've got to realize that I am powerless over this. And I want you to take another step further than that. I want you to talk to somebody about it. Again, some of you are going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to participate in this. Well, you're going to keep living defeated. You're going to keep going through that cycle and saying, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep doing this? And you just need to say, look, this is what I'm powerless over, and I need the Holy Spirit power to, realize, to help me overcome it and help me to heal through it. Get help. Get help. The second thing is this, and this is kind of neat. I want to kind of explain this to you as well. We need power from the Holy Spirit that dwells within us over the things that we're powerless over. And then number two is you need to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Paul again in Galatians 5, 24 and 25. Galatians 5, 24 and 25. He says this, Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, what, what have they done? They have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. And what are they doing? They're starving it out again. And then look what it says. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Then let's go back to verse 16 of that same chapter in, in chapter 5. Paul said, If we walk in the Spirit, we will not gratify the desires of our flesh. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What does this mean? What does it mean? Prompting by the Spirit. This is going to be new for some of you. This is going to be something that I want everybody in this room to try if you are a follower of Christ and you don't understand this. 
The prompting of the Holy Spirit of God that dwells within you. It kind of goes like this. Anybody watch Dancing with the Stars? I do. I, I liked it when Sadie Robertson was on there. I was pulling for her. I, I thought they were real neat. Anyway, I liked watching it. But I don't know a lot about dancing. I, you know, I've never been a dancing person. But anyway, um, I understand that on Dancing with the Stars, usually there's a leader and a follower. Usually the one who knew how to dance was leading the one that didn't know how to dance. That's, that's the way I understood it to be. But I've always heard that in dancing, you have one leads and the other has to follow. And with Dancing with the Stars, hearing them talk and a lot of this stuff going on, I, I understood that that they spent a lot of time together. It was just, I mean, they spent a lot of time, and it was, you know, really, really tough at times spending this time together. But they, they also had to listen to one another. In other words, the person that was leading, you know, the other person had to listen to understand what was going on. And then after they spent time together and they listened to one another, then the one following would learn to, the prompts of the leader. It just started coming natural. It just started happening more and more often because they were spending time together and they were listening to one another. And now they're understanding the promptings of the leader, the followers understanding of the leader. And you see, this is the same way with the Spirit. I want to kind of give that illustration because with the Spirit, for some of you, this is going to be new. For the Spirit, you've got to spend time with the Holy Spirit. There's got to be time that you're spending with the Holy Spirit. And the more time you spend with the Holy Spirit and you listen to the Holy Spirit, you listen to what He's telling you, then He's going to start prompting you. He's going to start prompting you in different things in different areas of your life. And that's going to create a whole new walk if you haven't started doing this. Because some of you say, well, this just doesn't happen to me. Well, I've got something for you too, all right? But anyway, I want to help you. I want to help you because there's been, I could just go on and on at times when the Holy Spirit has prompted me in my life and it is absolutely amazing. And there's sometimes I don't listen, so I'm not perfect either. There's times that I don't listen to the prompting and I know I need to, so I'm not perfect either. But how do we keep in step with the Spirit of God? We've got to spend time. We've got to listen. And then we've got to, to really listen to the promptings of when He prompts us in a certain direction. The more mature you come, the more you're going to recognize which way He's telling you to go and what He's prompting you to do. He's leading me this way. He's prompting me that way. He's telling me to, to, to do this, to do that, to talk to that person. But when you get close, the Bible says that he will not gratify the desires of your flesh. In other words, you will not, he will not gratify the desires of your flesh. The desires of your flesh are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The more you walk with the Holy Spirit and walk with God, your intimacy is going to grow and temptations are going to decrease. And they're going to be a lot less. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go away. I'm not saying they're going to totally disappear. But they're going to... In my own life, it's been like my, the presence of God in my life is so much more than anything else whenever it comes to struggling like that. And when, uh, there's so much peace that comes when, walk, when you're walking with the Spirit. Your industry grows, and then your temptations are going to decrease. Now, some of you say, well, this just doesn't work for me. Prompting doesn't work for me. It just doesn't happen. Well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to start praying and asking the Holy Spirit to prompt you and show you in the direction you should go. I'm talking to believers, of, in, the followers of Christ. You've accepted Christ. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. I want you to start praying in that way. And then I want you to start writing down, or you can put it in your phone, or you can email it to yourself, whatever you want to do. Every time the Holy Spirit prompts you to do something, I want you to write it down. You say, I don't want to do that. Well, then just keep living that cycle, that keep doing that circle. I'll guarantee if you start doing this, and you start saying, Lord, Holy Spirit, show me the, which direction I should go, your promptings. And every time he does it throughout the day, you write it down. You take note of it. You, you just write it down. You'll be driving to work. You'll be driving to work, and all of a sudden, and, and you'll be listening to the radio. I've done this so many times. Uh, it happened to me not long ago. I was riding down the road, and I was thinking about something else, and I had a Christian song on, and I was just driving down the road, and all of a sudden, a lyric on the song just, like, jumped out at me. And it was exactly, and I was, like, not even listening to the song. And the Holy Spirit just prompted me something. And I went, wow. And I got a little teary-eyed, and I went, Holy Spirit, you just prompted me. Or I, didn't, I didn't use the word prompt, but it showed me a different direction or, or whatever I said. And it was just so amazing. And he, when you start asking, it's going to start happening. It's going to start showing up. And, and you're just going to be absolutely amazed at the way he prompts you. You'll be reading through your daily devotion. All of a sudden, something will jump off the page. Or maybe you're at the office, and you know, you've got that person that you like to avoid. Yeah, well, come on, be honest. Or wherever you go and there's a person that gets on your nerves and, you know, you, know, you, you just want to avoid them. And all of a sudden, you're going to be praying, hey, prompt me. And, uh, you know, Holy Spirit, and you're going to go into the office and all of a sudden, uh, the Holy Spirit's going to say, go talk to them. And you might resist a little at first, but you're going to do good. And you're going you're to say, okay, I'm going to listen. And you're going to go over there and maybe you're going to talk to them. And all of a sudden, 
after talking with them and them sharing something that's going on in their life, you have now helped them through a situation. And you walk away going, wow, Holy Spirit, I had no idea that was coming, but you prompted me to do that. And that's absolutely amazing. You see, when things like that happen, your intimacy with God grows. When The more you walk with God and the more you grow and you listen to God and hear Him talk, or Holy Spirit, and hear Him talking to you, the more that happens, the more fulfilled you are and the more of it you're going to want. And the less temptation. And then those things that you didn't really, I mean, you didn't really want to do anyway, that's not going to be anything now. That's going to be like, <laughs> that's nothing to compare to what just happened at the office. That's nothing. But the problem is that some of you are not walking with the Spirit. You're not walking with the Spirit. And I'm going to ask you, I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying, you bad little thing. No, I'm saying, that's the solution. This is how you can overcome this cycle that you've been in and this thing that you just hate. Because you need to spend time with the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. And you need to listen and listen to His promptings. And as He shows you what to do, it's not going to be your way. It's going to be a totally different way a lot of times. You say, well, that still doesn't work for me. Well, try this. Take 15 minutes a day, and you just sit down. And, and you just sit down if you want to get on your knees, if you want to sit in the chair, if you want to stand. And I want you to, I want you to tell the Holy Spirit this, all right? I'm going to pray for 15 minutes for somebody, and I want you to send me the names of people that you want me to pray for. And you'll be sitting there, and I promise this is going to happen. You're going to be sitting there, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is just going to send names in your head. I don't know how fast it'll be. It may just one right now. It may be one or two or three or four. And you're going to go, start praying for them because you've already told the Holy Spirit you're going to start praying for these people, right? That's what you're going to do. So you're going to start praying for them, and all of a sudden these names are coming in. And all of a sudden you're going, wow. And now 15 minutes is done gone, and you're like, wow, that was a quick 15 minutes. And then you're going to realize, wow, that person asked me to pray for them at the office, and I never did. That person, my, that family member was going through this situation and, and I never did even pray for them. And the Holy Spirit's going to bring that back into your head. And then you're going to start realizing, wow, I wasn't listening to the prompting of the Spirit when they asked me to pray the first time because I guarantee if they ask you to pray, the Spirit would say pray for them. You see how that works? Take 15 minutes and just say, God, I'm going to spend 15 minutes. Holy Spirit, you send me some names and I'm going to pray for these names. And I'll guarantee you there's names going to come. You're going to go, wow. And what's that going to do? I want you to help to realize what you have in the Holy Spirit that's dwelling inside of you. What's, what's really inside of you that can help you overcome anything. Paul says, look, I don't care what it is you're going through. There's not, nothing too much for you to bear that I can't find a way out for you, and I will find a way out for you. Every single time, you don't have to live with that struggle. You don't have to continue in that cycle anymore. i got something better to offer. But you've got to walk with the Spirit. You've got to walk with Him daily. You've got to continue to listen to Him, continue to spend time, and really listen, not just go, all right, my to-do list. i got to spend 15 minutes with God. All right, and be done. No, really listen to what he wants to do. And when you're going through, you're driving to work. Say, all right, Holy Spirit, just speak to me. You don't have to say the word prompting. Holy Spirit, just speak to me. Holy Spirit, show me what I should do in this situation. Holy Spirit, guide me in this way. Holy Spirit, should I go this way? The Holy Spirit is there to show you which way to go and how to do things in your life. And the things of the flesh is, is the opposite of the ways of the Spirit. And the Spirit's going to help you stay away from those temptations and the sinful nature that you and I have that the Satan likes to use all the time. The good news is, is there's no obligation to sin. Love that verse. There's no obligation to sin whatsoever. I don't care what you're addicted to, what kind of problems you have, whether you worry, whatever your sinful nature is, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Thank good. Holy Spirit, lead me. Holy Spirit, you can help me overcome it. I am powerless. I write this down. I'm powerless, and I know you can help me overcome this, and then prompt me. I am spending time with you. I'm listening. Holy Spirit, prompt me all through my daily walk. I'm going to listen to you and obey you no matter what, and you will overcome anything Satan throws in your life. You want to get out of that circle, that cycle? You want to quit, quit that same old, you get to that point like I'm at the cheesecake. Why did I eat those three slices of cheesecake? I mean, it happens to us. And some of you right now, you're, you're going, wow. Wow. I don't want that anymore. I'm, I'm tired of that. I'm tired of the hurt that it brings, the destruction it brings, the pain it brings in my life. I'm tired of feeling defeated. It's time that I want to walk by the Spirit. I'm ready. Let's all pray together. Father, Holy Spirit, 
I pray right now you do what only you can do. You've already been ministering. You've already been speaking into lives. And I'm thank, I thank you that your love is unconditional. For every person in this room, you love us and you only want the best for us. You dwell inside of us because you care about us. You don't want us to live defeated. Now work only as you can. Father, we love you. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit into our lives. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe you're here and you realize that there are some things that you're powerless over. And you're tired of this. You're tired of the hurt and pain. You don't want to be like this anymore. Well, now's the time to do something about it. Now's the time to get victory. At least start it by recognizing that you are powerless over it. And you're going to continue that cycle as long as you keep doing it on your own. His power is more than our strength. Realize that. Do business with God right now. Just say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I commit it to you. If you're here and you say, Pastor Carl, that's me. There's something or some things that I'm powerless over. And the Holy Spirit has revealed that to me. And I want you to get victory. I want to pray with you. As you pray, I want to pray with you. Claim it right now. Don't walk out of here knowing what you're powerless over. I think raising your... Sometimes people say, why do you even raise your hands? I'm getting ready to get you to raise your hand in a minute. Why do I do that? Because I think sometimes it makes it more of a commitment for you. Hey, I, I admit it right there. And plus, I want to pray for you. If you're here and say, Pastor Carl, that's me. There's some things in my life that I'm powerless over. I need God's power in my life. That's you. Just lift your hand up right now. Just lift it up. Hands all over the room. All over the room. This is where we live. This is where we are. It's time to claim victory. Put your hands down. You start praying right there in your seat, and I'm going to pray for you here. Father, God, I thank you, Holy Spirit, how you've ministered to every person. In this room, you're ministering to us. And Father, I have no idea. I'm so glad that your Holy Spirit knows how to minister to every one of us exactly what we're going through and that you've got the victory plan and something awesome as a walk with you. It's far better than what we've been fighting. Father, I pray for these individuals. Give them strength. Give them courage to step out, Lord, and just and just to, to trust you and walk with you and spend time with you and listen to you and listen to the promptings that you give them and myself. Lord, help us. Help us to get victory. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Claim it now. You continue to pray. Just continue to pray. And I'll say again at the end of the service, the altar's always open. Maybe you just want to come down, just bow down, and worship during the last song. It's always open. Maybe you're praying for somebody else. Maybe you're praying for somebody who's not even here. I don't know. Get about and eyes are closed. No one's looking at me. One more thing I want to do. You know, maybe you're here and your life is a mess. And you're thinking, well, God probably doesn't love me or maybe he doesn't love me or all the things that I've done is just horrible and you know, I've never really given my life to him. Well, let me just tell you again, he loves you unconditionally right now. He loves you so much. And I'm so glad that he doesn't say, you got to clean your mess up before you can come to me. He doesn't say that. No, he says, look, if you'll just follow me, you'll just walk with me, I'll help you clean that mess up because that's how much I love you. That's how much I care about you. If you just walk with me, I'll help you. But you can't keep following those fleshly desires. You can't keep following the sinful nature. Or you're going to keep getting the same results. And if you're here and you say, Pastor Carl, that's me. I don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling me, in me. And I know that's what I need right now. I believe that Jesus did die on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven. And I do believe that God will send me the Holy Spirit. And that's what I need to get power over me the things that I'm powerless over. If that's you, man, every Christian in here is wanting you to receive Christ today because that's your source of help 
That's what you need. That's your hope. That's your future. That's everything. The greatest decision you'll ever make. It's not only the decision for this side of eternity, but it's, it's going to be a decision where you spend eternity forever. If you hear my voice on television, internet, there's no mistake you're listening. The Holy Spirit drew this channel to this place on the internet at our website so that you could hear what I'm saying right now. The Holy Spirit is drawing you into a relationship. So whether you're here or listening to my voice, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's your next step. That's what you need to get help and hope overcome your temptations in life. You say, well, what must I do? The Bible says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that if you'll confess your sin, He will forgive you. He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. That's right. You say, He'll forgive me of my sin, your mess? Yes, He'll, he'll wipe it all clean. He says, look, if you'll just confess your sin and follow me, hey, I'll help you clean your mess up. I'll wipe all your past sins away, give you a new start, and you can walk with me. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you might be saying, well, what must I do? I'm going to pray right now. And I, you're not praying to me, but you can pray with me to a holy God that says you need to confess your sin and surrender your life to Him. And the moment you seriously mean that, He's going to, again, forgive you of your sin and you can follow Him and walk with Him. And then God, the Bible says that God's going to send the Holy Spirit to you. So what we've talked about today, you can walk with the Spirit and He'll show you what to do. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, pray with me right now. Say, Dear Jesus, I know you're speaking to me. I know this is why I'm here today. Jesus, thank you for loving me and dying on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven. Thank you, God, for, for sitting, allowing Jesus to die for my sin. But to the best I know how, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I choose to follow you. I surrender my life to you. I want to walk with you for the rest of the days of my life. I know that you have the power overcome what I can't. Thank you for loving me. I surrender to you. If you're here and you called out and you meant it, guess what? He is faithful and just. He forgave you of your sin. You're now a child of God. That's the greatest decision you've ever made. The Bible teaches that you will have heaven and eternity with Jesus whenever one day when we leave this side of eternity. You've got that. But not only that, on this side of eternity, He's there to help you and to guide you. And God has now sent you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has now come to you to live in your vessel, to guide you, to comfort you, to convict you of sin. So many more things that He's going to do for you. If you're here, say, Pastor Carl, nobody, nobody's looking around. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. Can I rejoice with you if you made that decision? Man, I get excited when people come to know Christ and the Holy Spirit dwells there. But if you're here, you say, Pastor Carl, that's me. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. That's not my intent. I just want to rejoice with you. you. Say, Pastor Carl, that was me. I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Why don't you slip your hand up? Don't even hesitate. Put it up right now. And say, Pastor Carl, that was me. Anybody like that here today? Say, Pastor Carl, that was me. I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. whether you raised your hand or not, if you received Christ as your Lord and Savior. If I could get you to do something for me, if it, take your communication card and fill that out. And on the back it says, I received Christ as my Lord and Savior. Maybe you didn't want to raise your hand, but I'd love to get you a Bible or follow up with you and answer any questions you may have. And you can place these communication cards in case you're new to the church. As you go out into the lobby, you can just place them in the, in the baskets that are there. Somebody will show you if you're not sure. I mean, if you made that decision, we want to rejoice with you. If you're watching today on internet or television, if you made a decision to follow Christ, if there's anything we can do to help you, please get in touch with us and let us know. We'd like to follow up, get you a Bible, get you a, a, a starting plan to start reading, teaching you how you can grow even more in your walk with Him. Father, we love you and I praise you for the decisions made here today. Lord, thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for this community you've put us in. Lord, may we be the hands and feet. May we walk in the Spirit as you prompt us, God. 
that Lord, it, it'll fulfill us for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing, but also how it's going to affect lives around us in such a positive way that's going to further the kingdom. Father, we love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's give it up for the Lord. Amen. Let's all stand if you will. Beautiful God, laying your majesty aside. You reached out in love to show me life. Lifted from darkness into light. Oh. Trading your righteousness for shame Despite all my pride and foolish ways Caught in your infinite 